Are good and evil two sides of the same coin? Get God Failed, Ariel Langford's disturbing account of a tortured soul manipulated by good and by evil. God Failed is available everywhere digital books are sold. We've been holding back on you. I'm Sutton Blackhill, and tonight, all will be revealed. We're searching for the Demonic Testament, a book written by a demon, and you're coming with us. Hey everyone, Wallet here. Thanks for being here. So, back when I started this investigation, I said I'd share everything with you. That you'd be my team, and we'd find the truth together. Well... I haven't exactly completely lived up to that. In any investigation, especially paranormal or supernatural, the most important thing is context. Sometimes you run into something that is so unexpected that you, uh, well, you don't know exactly what to make of it. What we're going to talk about with you tonight is is one of those unexpected somethings. So for the last week or so, I've had this reoccurring dream. Well, it's not really the same dream exactly. Every night, just a little more was revealed. On the first night, I was walking down this hall. It was dark with just a bit of a red tint. I suppose there were lights around, but they were dimmed enough so you couldn't really make out anything that was around. Everything outside of my direct vision was blurred, sort of like blinders. I kind of remember having this uneasy feeling, like when you know something bad is about to happen, but you're not quite sure what. The next night, it was the same thing. Except this time, I got to the end of the hallway, to a door, room number 633. At first, I thought it was some sort of hotel. But in the third dream, I realized it was a college dorm. The size of the halls revealed themselves with banners and posters. Things were still blurry, so I couldn't really tell what any of them said. But somehow, I knew they were school-related. This time when I got to the door, it opened, very slowly, revealing the room an inch at a time. Sort of like slow motion, except that it wasn't. The door bounced off the wall, closing slightly, but not enough to obstruct the view of a young woman with blonde hair sitting at a desk. Bam! Wide awake. I couldn't get back to sleep. I kept wondering who this woman was. And why I was dreaming about her. The next night I didn't have the dream. Sutton and I sort of overindulged on a bottle of gin that Gounod gave us. And I think the alcohol prevented me from dreaming. I did, however, wake up to a card sitting on my nightstand. It had that familiar 10th century sigil of Baphomet on the front. And on the inside it simply said, Believe what Sarath shows you. As you slumber. And it was signed Thad, Sarath's fifth apostle. The night after that, same thing, walking down the hallway. This time I could make out the wazoo banners, the posters for all the parties and the club meetings. And like the night before, I get to the door and it opens very slowly. The same young woman sits at the desk. I see her with her head up, staring at the wall, which I think it's kind of odd, kind of strange. But then I notice something even stranger. The woman is writing something on a piece of blank white paper. And then, wide awake. But things are kind of starting to connect. The final dream started out at the door. It again opened slowly, revealing the woman at the desk writing something on a piece of paper while seemingly in a trance. It seemed to float into the room, 
moving towards the woman on her desk. I stop behind her, able to look over her shoulder and see what she's writing. On the paper it says, Sarath started the fire in the Harrington house. He was also the one responsible for, and as I was trying to see the rest of the sentence, the woman's head spun around backwards and screamed at me, waking me wide awake. The young woman's face was pale, dead pale, and her eyes were red. I did not recognize the woman, but I knew exactly who it was. Now, before I go on, I want you all to know that after each one of these dreams, I woke up at exactly 6.33 every single time. And this brings us to the thing that we've kept from you. Mixed in with the pages of Ariel's novel, where these papers covered in scribbles and passages, some of them look like random thoughts she wrote down as she processed everything, And some of those we shared on social media a few days ago. Others, those were more disturbing. Yeah, we weren't quite sure what these were, but the notes described things that happened in the Harrington house. Things that neither Ariel or Christian would have knowledge of. The writing on these particular pages didn't match the others. The ones we shared with you. The fingerprints on the pages only contained Ariel's. And there was no match for the handwriting. It didn't match Robbie or Christian. It didn't match anyone. We didn't know where the notes came from or how legit they were. The only thing we knew was these notes matched what Ariel used to fill in the gaps and God failed. Things like, Sarath possessed your brother. As Robbie, Sarath crossed the street to the Harringtons. As Sarath walked, he created a two-inch-thick black leather book, void of title, which he gave to the priest, who left it on Madeline's nightstand to find, which became this in the book. Sarath guided Robbie's body over to the Harrington's house. As he took his first step off the curb and into the street, a white light flashed in his upturned hands. There was no need for him to look both ways for cars because he knew there weren't any. Continuing to hold his palms up, close to one another, the white turned to gray, and finally black. When he reached the other side of the street, a black leather book, a couple inches thick, with no title on the cover, weighed his small hands down. He walked up to the door and spotted the priest. This was working out perfect. The version in God Failed is much more detailed than in what was written on the paper, Almost as if Sarath showed her what happened. Yeah, so at first we thought that maybe she had a boyfriend or someone helping her write the fictionalized gaps in the story. But after the series of dreams I had, we were able to connect some things together. And it's not at all what we expected. Now, before we go further, I know exactly what you're thinking. How can you trust the dreams? At first I didn't. I thought it was just the investigation and seeing these notes day after day bleeding into my subconscious, resulting in these vivid, very vivid dreams. Nothing more, nothing less. But, we have the note from one of Sarath's apostles telling me the dreams are Sarath's way of sharing information. The irony of this is, Showing me things as I sleep isn't all that different from the woman I dreamt about sitting there writing things down as though she was in a trance. Mm -hmm. The other thing that points to these dreams being legit is before the Thanksgiving holiday, Sutton started putting together a dossier on Ariel. After the final dream, Sutton shared the file with me. And when I opened it, I saw Ariel's picture. It was the woman in the dream. Now, at that point, I had to trust that the dreams were a manipulative tactic by Sarath to feed us information. Oh, right. You know, his his way of letting us know these gaps in God failed are in fact real, not fiction like we believed. So going through the notes Wally took after each dream, 
We believe Sarath possessed Ariel in short bursts while she was at school. While in control, he gave her insight into Christian's life and other events she wouldn't have otherwise known. We think this happened several times. Yeah, and, and if we go by the number of pages, we think he took control, I don't know, around at least 12 times, maybe even more. You know, the thing that disturbs me about all of this... What? Looking at these pages written in a different hand and the things that they say makes me wonder if Ariel was manipulated into writing the book. Hmm. Are you suggesting that these aren't her words, that they're Sarath's? No, no, not, well, not exactly. What if writing the book wasn't some sort of therapy, but instead she was manipulated to write it so Sarath could get his story told? At least this part of it. This was written so we'd find it and publish it. Okay. So, to bring this story, well, his story, to the people. So you're saying that Sarath wants everyone to know how powerful he is and what he's capable of. Yes. A precursor of what's to come, maybe. Hmm. Wow. All right. Well, this puts a bit of a different angle on things. Hmm. Okay, so roll with me here for a minute. Okay. So Godfield mentions Madeline's lost Bible, which is the one that Robbie brought over to Madeline, mm -hmm. possessed by Surat. During the Holy Week incident in 1979, the 12 people who died and became Surat's apostles claimed a demon asked them about a book. So what if the Demonic Testament isn't just one book? What if, like the New and Old Testament, the Demonic Testament is made up of several books? God failed, the Lost Bible, and maybe the book mentioned during Holy Week? Exactly. Who knows? There could be even more. Jesus, fuck. That does switch things up a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, but, you know, it, it's just a thought. You know, it's... I, I do think it's definitely something to consider as we go forward, but it kind of makes me want to dive into God Failed again and see if there's any any sort of clues that we might have missed. Yeah, if you believe the Bible, God always spread his word through specific people, you know, never directly to the masses. Maybe Sarath is doing the same thing. That makes me think of how Sarath used Robbie Langford to give Madeline the lost Bible. He's also the one who gave us God Failed in Christian's journal. Hmm. That's interesting. Do you think he read any of this? Does he know he was possessed by Sarath? Man, I don't know. I do know that I would have read it. But that's just the investigator in me. I couldn't help myself. But some, you know, they just don't want to know. The whole ignorance is bliss thing. Well... Robbie definitely saw some shit as a kid his age shouldn't see or experience. That's for sure. Seeing your sister's boyfriend locked up in a cell, the horrible stuff in the basement, I can understand him not wanting to read any of this. But I have a feeling he did read it before giving it to me. Well, do you think he wanted it out there too? That I don't know. But I think... I think he's sort of fucked up too. <laughs> Maybe he just wanted validation on that it happened, that it was real. You know, in a lot of ways, he and I are sort of the same in that. Yeah. Well, okay, I never expected anyone to believe what I posted on my Instagram account. I hope people would, but I didn't expect it. I did it to put these experiences out there, hoping someone would say, I believe you, and offer, I don't know, just kind of offer... Well, when I heard you launched an investigation off my posts and that you were looking for me, I couldn't believe it. After two years, I finally had someone believe this. It changed my life, seriously. I'm not sure Robbie or Ariel had that. Yeah, they probably didn't. And it, it, it's hard. I, I know. I know it's hard. You know, it's society's kind of fucked up you know it's okay to believe in this all-knowing sky daddy who controls and creates everything but 
it's weird. You know, the, the Bible talks about the devil, demons, angels, and all that stuff. But the minute someone claims to have seen one or has had contact with one, they're considered insane. Mm-hmm. I mean, hell, Madeline was put in a psych hold because she claimed to see an angel. True. And, you know, I've investigated the paranormal practically all my life. I've seen things. Trust me, I've seen things. And I know things that the average person wouldn't in a million years believe. The supernatural is a whole different ball game. Hauntings, things that go bump in the night, that's one thing. Demonic possession, that's another. Getting visits from the dead who live in purgatory, yeah, that's a whole <laughs> other thing. Mm. Getting notes from the apostles of a demon, you okay? Yeah. I was just thinking... We know Ariel wrote God Failed while at school, but we're not sure exactly when she started it or when she finished it. We do know she died from a fall. Was this experience too much for her and she committed suicide after finishing the book? And did Serath manipulate her into doing it? Oh, shit. What does that mean for us? The investigation. More importantly... What does it mean for our souls? This episode may be over, but don't miss what happens next. Follow A Walk in Darkness on Instagram or Twitter for the latest developments in the investigation. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe.